Okay, folks, welcome to part two of interrupts. Uh, we're talking about money's points on interrupts, and this is part two. Uh, we're going to be talking about the interrupt control module and code. Uh, I've already done part one describing some basics of what interrupts are and why they're useful and what happens during interrupt handling, and this is part two. If you uh, haven't watched part one, there will be a link right here that you can click on to go and see the other video. So. Uh, let's talk about what happens during an interrupt. We reviewed this at the end of the last video. and Basically what happens is when some peripheral triggers an interrupt, the first thing that happens is that it goes and looks up a interrupt service routine in the interrupt vector table. So this is a function that's associated with some trigger or interrupt request uh, that gets executed whenever that um, uh, trigger happens. Right. So for instance, when this ticks down all the way to zero, it'll trigger this function remove bread to execute and what happens is it pauses execution of whatever main function is currently happening executes the function and then resumes uh, resumes execution there now what we're going to talk about in this video is how to set up all this stuff in our particular piece of hardware so the first thing we need to do is to set up a peripheral to generate an interrupt such as uh, general purpose timer overflow which is the example we're going to use I'm not going to go over how to set up the peripheral uh, to do that in this video um, you can look it up in the data sheet we talked about it in class uh, that kind of thing so we'll just take this as a given uh, then what we're going to focus on here is setting up the interrupt system to respond to the interrupt request this involves copying a pointer to the ISR into the vector table uh, setting the level and priority of the interrupt and then enable, enabling the request source, which means clearing an interrupt mask. So the first thing we need to do, actually before we even copy the vector uh, ISR into the vector table, is to write ourselves an interrupt service routine. And this is just a function with a special clause in front of it. It doesn't return anything. So here's the name of the interrupt service routine. Uh, it can be anything you want. Usually we put a name ISR into it, indicating that it's an interrupt service routine. But again, it can be any function. Uh, but in front of it, we have to put decal spec, which is declare special in parentheses interrupt. And what this does, it tells us this isn't a normal function; it's an interrupt function. It's going to use a different, um, it's going to use a, a different return from procedure. So instead of uh, RTS return uh, to subroutine, um, it's going to use an RTI, which is a return uh, interrupt. Uh, which means that it, it pops things off of a different stack. Remember that stack where we saved our bookmark for where we were executing? That stack is separate from our normal stack, so it's going to use that stack to return instead of the normal stack. And then the, the inside of the interrupt service routine, the function itself, we have to clear the interrupt flag, and this is dependent on source. Uh, to do this, it's really handy if we look up the interrupt source number. So in interrupt flags, the, these are flags, these are uh, bits, usually a single bit in a register somewhere that signals to the system that an interrupt needs to be handled. Uh, the interrupt flag should always be cleared in the ISR so that the ISR is called only once, right? So basically, this bit is set when the hardware triggers an interrupt, and it's actually the same signal that triggers the interrupt. So if we don't clear it, it's going to cause the interrupt to be triggered again and again and again and again forever and we'll never actually get out of the interrupts anymore. It will pause execution forever. So the interrupt system, the interrupt service routine should always clear the flag very first thing. Uh, these flags are specific to interrupts and they're doc documented uh, specifics to the sp uh, specific to the particular peripheral that's triggering the interrupt. So they're documented in the peripheral documentation, not usually in uh, many other places. Though, uh, when we look up our interrupt source number, uh, it tells us what flag it is. So for our example, we're looking for the general purpose timer uh, timer overflow event. Right. So here we've got, uh, we look here, we're looking at the module, we're looking for general purpose timer, and we're looking for the timer overflow event, which is this guy right here. So we know it's source number 41. The flag is TOF, and this is going to be some bit in the general purpose timer module. And uh, apparently all we have to do is write TO, uh, 1 to the TOF bit to clear uh, that particular flag. So this gives us all the information that we need to figure out how to write our interrupt service routine besides what we want to happen when the interrupt is triggered. The code to do this, uh, once we have that, we can, once we have the interrupt service routine, 
uh, the code to register it in the vector table is right here. So what this is, what vector RAM is, is an externally defined memory location. It's basically an array of 255 pointers, 32-bit pointers, to functions in the system. The first 64 are used by the exception system for system errors. The rest of them, uh, the rest of them, uh, numbers 64 through uh, 255 are used for the peripheral interrupt system. So these are the 64 through 255 are the ones we need. But all of the peripherals start counting at one. So we add the peripheral uh, source number to the offset of 64 and that gives us an index into the vector table that we can use to copy our interrupt service routine pointer right here. Right? Next we need to set the level and priority of the interrupt. So each interrupt source has an associated level and priority and basically uh, we have levels 1 through 7, priorities 0 through 7, and these uh, and levels supersede priorities. Basically, this is for resolving uh, when two interrupts occur at the same time. If one has a higher level, that one's going to get, the one with a higher level is going to get executed first. If they both have the same level and one has a higher priority, that one's, the one with the higher priority is going to get executed first. Um, so levels are more important than priorities. To set the level and priority of an interrupt, it's dependent. We uh, use the uh, interrupt control registers, and e there is one interrupt control register for each source. So that means there's two. Uh, uh, that means there's 64 interrupt control registers, uh, and each one has the lower three bits is the interrupt priority, and the uh, next three bits, bits five through uh, three through five, are the interrupt level. And we basically write the interrupt level and priority into these registers, and those are used to determine uh, which one gets executed first. Uh, to do this, it's a pretty easy little thing. We've got a macro here that basically allows us to index uh, the interrupt control register associated with a source number by using just these little parentheses. And you can go and look at the header files to see how this is defined. It's pretty simple. It's just an offset. Uh, to a memory location. Then we take the priority level, the uh, uh, interrupt, yeah, the priority level of the interrupt, uh, shift it left by three, that gives us a gap, it puts, puts the in, uh, interrupt level in bits three through five, and then we take the, and then we OR that with the priority level that copies the priority into the lower three bits, giving us a whole value that we can copy directly into the control register, and it works great. So the next thing is to enable the interrupt sources. So the system by default has all interrupts disabled. So if you look here, these are the interrupt mask registers. And there's two of them because there's 64 interrupt sources. There's two of these registers. There's the low registers, which has uh, interrupts 1 through 31. And then we've got the high, which has interrupts uh, uh, 32 through 63. Right? But notice they're all indexed by bit because we can only access a long word in our system is the biggest uh, register size that we can access at once. So we can't treat all 64 of these bits as one thing. So the lower 32 bits, the lower 32 bits control the lower 31 registers. You can see it goes from 1 to 31. So there's only 31 interrupts in this one. And then the lowest bit in the low interrupt mask is a mask all. It's a global mask. And these ones all at the bottom here are what the state of the registers are when the system resets. So here we can see that this thing is all ones when the, when the system is, is initialized, when the system is reset, which means that no interrupts are enabled. And this one right here, if we set a one in this position, it sets a one in all the rest of the positions, no matter what the rest of the values are. So this is uh, how we control the uh, entire system, um, uh, how we control, uh, this is how we control masking all of the rest of the interrupts. So to set a interrupt, uh, to, to clear an interrupt, to enable an interrupt to run, we have to clear the corresponding bit to that register. In this case, we want to clear, uh, we want to clear the bit for mask, uh, for interrupt source number 41. And that means that it's not going to be in this lower register because we've only got 1 through 31 here. 
it needs to be in the upper register. So we take uh, 41 minus uh, 32, that gives us 9, which is where we're, which is the one that we're going to clear. The code to do this for any interrupt is in the unmask source function. And what this looks like is basically it decides which of the two uh, registers we need to modify. So in this case, um, if the source, our source is 41, if it's greater than 31, it's going to go in the high register and we need to clear a corresponding bit. But we have to subtract uh, the 32, the lower 32 numbers off to get the proper bit and this is just a standard clearing function. Uh, here we are um, uh, here we're uh, clearing uh, the interrupts in the lower mask register but we're also making sure that the least significant bit is cleared right here. That's what this FFFE is. We're clearing the least significant bit and making sure mask all doesn't get inadvertently set and we mask off everything in the in the registers. Uh, and last but not least, we need to enable global interrupts. And this means we need to clear the execution level bits in the status register. And the status register and these particular bits, the execution level or interrupt mask level uh, bits, bits seven or bits eight through ten, are the interrupt mask level bits. And these are really, really the execution level bits. And you can see that they default to 111, which is seven, which is the highest uh, priority. We, which means that all interrupts are disabled. Anything less than or equal to seven is is disabled. Uh, and basically, what happens is when an interrupt is triggered, it looks in uh, it looks in its interrupt mask priority level. It looks in its priority level um, in the uh, interrupt control register. It looks that up, and then it compares that particular number with these three bits. If the priority level of the interrupt is less than these three bits, it doesn't get executed. Um, which means that this system, uh, these three bits here, will control whether or not any low level interrupts execute. Uh, anything in the seven level, which is really high level, really complex, really super important system functions, will get executed because it's the equal level of execution, but um, uh, anything below that won't. So, since these default to seven on reset, no low level interrupts execute. We might want to use, we do want to use the low level interrupts. So we set it to zero on, uh, which allows any interrupts to execute. Uh, to do that, we use this little assembly function. Basically, basically what we are doing is loading the status register, uh, clearing bits eight through 10 in the status register and writing it back. Uh, we do this in assembly because in assembly, it's in a supervisory mode, which allows us to access uh, the status register, which normally we're not able to do from the C execution level. So that's really it. If there's uh, once you do all of those, basically those four steps, you copy, uh, write an interrupt service routine, associate it with a interrupt source by copying it into the interrupt vector table, then unmask the interrupts, set the priority and execution levels and uh, enable global interrupts. The whole thing kind of takes off on its own. Um, let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you guys in class.